fantastic to uh, to see everybody today those of you that are watching online we want to say thank you as well if you got your Bible I want you to turn over to Psalm 107 while you're turning there a couple of things I want to announce to you first of all I want to uh, announce that next Sunday morning after our morning worship service we will have uh, a brief special call business meeting. For those of you, uh, we will be voting on our 2021 budget. Uh, it's these blue sheets. You can find those uh, at various places. I encourage you to pick one of those up. If you've got any questions or anything, uh, feel free to contact uh, Miss Summer or you can contact uh, any of those that are on our uh, finance committee as well. But we will uh, have a brief uh, business meeting next Sunday uh, to vote on that. Also, all of our men, uh, I want to encourage you tonight or this afternoon from 5 to 7 o'clock over in the Christian Life Center, we're going to be having a, uh, a men's Bible study. Um, I'm going to be, uh, be talking about becoming and preaching about becoming the man that God has called us to be. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. It's five principles that uh, are very vital for every single man. And so I encourage you, uh, we're going to meet over in the Christian Life Center. We've got some tables set up, and we'll be able to spread out and everything over there. And so I encourage you, 5 o'clock this afternoon to 7 o'clock, we will probably have a break in the middle. If you want to bring you something to drink or whatever else, you're more than welcome uh, to do that. Um, but that is this afternoon. I know the ladies have their Bible study this afternoon, choir practices this afternoon, so we've just got so much going on. Also, next uh, Saturday morning at 8 o'clock, we're going to meet right here. If uh, any of you that are interested, we started it out with, with our men, and we decided that uh, there is some things that uh, if some of our ladies want to go, we have a, uh, a mission day that we're going to be doing. We're going to be going over to one of our church members' houses, and uh, we've just got various uh, things inside and outside that we're going to be working on, painting, um, just a lot of things. And so it's just a ministry and a, a mission opportunity that we have. So I encourage you, that is next Saturday uh, at uh, 8 a.m. And then also next Sunday, believe it or not, is our family uh, Thanksgiving dinner. And uh, that will be at 5 o'clock over in the Christian Life Center. The church is providing all the food this time, and so you don't have to worry about trying to bring anything. We figured with COVID and everything, it would be better to just kind of centralize everything that we're doing. And so, uh, but that is next Sunday. So just so much um, that we have going. Well, 
for any of you that have looked in the bulletin and saw the title for the sermon today, you may see all I see. I love saying something like that because everybody starts picking up the bulletin, and uh, and and you're going to see a title that might be a little. I don't know if it's interesting to you, but it might be intriguing to you because the title of the sermon today is this: Let the fool give thanks. You say, well, preacher, that's not very nice. Well, uh, listen, all we're going to do is just look at what God's Word says. Over the last couple of weeks, we have been looking at our Thanksgiving series. We talked a couple of weeks ago about those of us who were wandering, wandering in the wilderness, wandering uh, in life that we can give thanks. Last week, we looked at the rebellious. We talked about how God's Word says that uh, the rebellious can give thanks, but today... I think we're just going to get real personal. As we do, let's stand and let's read these verses of Scripture. We're in Psalms 107, and I'm going to read verses 17 through 22. It says this, Some became fools through their rebellious ways, and they suffered affliction because of their iniquities. They loathed all food and drew near the gates of death. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them. He rescued them from the grave. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. Let them sacrifice thanks offerings and tell of his works with songs of joy. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for today. We thank you, God, for the incredible privilege and joy that you've given us to be here. And God, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray that you will just bless today. Lord, I pray that, that you will speak through me today, Lord, that your word will be very uh, clear today. Your word says in Isaiah 55 that, that it accomplishes that which you have called it and designed it to do. And God, we're just simply asking for that today. And Lord, a as we give thanks to you, God, as we give you praise and glory and honor, God, I pray that you will inhabit that praise today. Lord, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. You may be seated. It starts and says, some became fools through their rebellious ways. It's an interesting transition from last week. Last week's message was uh, on the rebellious and how the rebellious can call upon the name of the Lord for salvation, for forgiveness, through repentance, and how God does that mighty work that's there. Well, now the progression takes that passage of Scripture, and it says, for many people who were rebellious, it says that they became fools. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. My guess is there's not a single one of us in here today that wish to be called a fool. Uh, that is not one of those areas. I never, uh, you know, I, I don't, uh, I, I never uh, made myself out to be the smartest person in the entire world. My wife uh, is much, much, much smarter than I am. Um, I, I've told you this joke before, but it's been a long time, so Beth doesn't know it. I was going to bring it out again. But I, I, those of you that, that know most pastors way out punt their coverage. In other words, God is very gracious to pastors, and, uh, and I am no exception to that. God gave me uh, the most incredible wife uh, that I could ever have, and she is, when I say that she's smarter than me, that I'm, not, I'm, I'm saying she's a whole lot smarter than I am. I'm telling you all the truth. My wife went to Sanford University. Most of you know she has her doctorate degree uh, in pharmacy. She is a pharmacist, been a pharmacist since 1999. She, uh, uh, throughout all of her schooling, she had grades that I never even, I didn't even know you could make those grades as well as she did. And I'll never forget the day that she 
graduated from Sanford University. We were there at the Wright Center, and uh, they called her name Miss Bethany Davenport Mosley, and she walked across that stage, and she got her doctorate degree, and it said magna cum laude. And I thought, man, that is awesome, you know, that, that uh, I have a wife who finished her doctorate degree, and, and she was magna cum laude. Well, for those of you that know me, I started college in 1992, and I went to college for 12 and a half years. Um, I did. That's not, that's not a lie. I, I started college in 1992. It took me about five or so years to uh, graduate from UAB because I worked full-time during that time. I went straight from there and went into uh, seminary and uh, went four full years of seminary. And then I, I, I went and I, I too went and finally uh, was able to, uh, to get my doctor of ministry degree and everything. And, and uh, you know, I always tell everybody that, you know, <coughs> you know, Beth graduated magna cum laude and I graduated thank the laude because... <laughs> Listen, listen, I, I hear people, I, I'll go into Hunter's office every once in a while, and, and folks, those of you that don't know, Hunter uh, graduated about a year or so ago uh, with his MDiv, his Master's of Divinity, and now he's working on his D-Men, his Doctor of Ministry degree and everything, and so I'll go into his office, and he's, you know, fresh in all of this stuff, and, and he'll be talking about this Greek stuff and this Hebrew stuff, and, and, and he'll ask me these questions, and I'll just remind him, I'm like, dude, I graduated waited from that stuff like in 2000 and uh and so I just let him know he's listen he's much smarter at that stuff than I am but never once have I wanted to be called a fool never I've never set out and just thought you know what I hope somebody calls me a fool today I hope somebody questions my intelligence. I hope somebody questions my knowledge. I hope somebody calls me a fool today. And yet we get into this passage of Scripture. And it, and it reminds us of four beautiful truths that even us foolish people can give thanks to God for. Let's walk through this today. I think, uh, I think this will speak to every one of our hearts. The first thing is this. Some of us have a past that haunts us. Look at the first part of verse 17 again. It said, some became fools, but why? Through their rebellious ways. Some became fools, it says, because of their rebellious ways. Scripture says this, There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof leads to death. In other words, there is a way that men seem to try to travel. And when we say men, we're talking about men and women, all of us. There's a way that we seem to try to walk toward. There's a way that seems like it's going to give us what this world offers. There's a way that it seems like this world is going to give us everything that we could think we could have. And it says there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof leads to death. And it is foolish to walk that direction it is foolish some of us have a past that haunts us as this verse says we became fools king david scripture defines king david as a man after god's own heart now i don't know about you but Far greater than ever being called a fool, I would love to be referred to as a man after God's own heart. That was King David. King David was a man after God's own heart. When I was in Israel, I had the joy and privilege of going to King David's grave. And it's absolutely incredible and how the Jewish people are so revered to everything that took place there. And for God's word to say that he's a man after God's own heart. But yet there was a time. There was a time when King David walked out on his rooftop. And unbeknownst to him, there was a sinful thought 
that was about to enter to his brain. As he looked over, he saw Bathsheba. You know, I've often said this. It wasn't a sin for him to see that the first time. You know why? That was just happenstance. That was just him being on that roof. But Scripture says that he, when he saw Bathsheba bathing on the roof on the other side, that he looked again. And at that moment, can I just tell you something? This man after God's own heart became a fool. The things that progressed after that. He, he, he goes and he gets one of his servants and he said, who is that? And his servant says, that is Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. You might be thinking, well, okay, well, who was Uriah? Uriah was the head of David's army who was out at battle fighting for King David. King David says to his servant, go bring her to me. They go and they bring Bathsheba to him, and you know the whole story. He commits adultery. She becomes pregnant. To try to cover it up, he calls Uriah in from the battlefields. Tries to trick him, tries to, to literally get him drunk to trick him. Nothing seems to work. And so David goes, listen, a man after God's own heart who became a fool and became a liar and became an adulterer. And then all of a sudden becomes a murderer. He sets Uriah up and has Uriah killed in the field just to make him look better. You know how the, the story goes. The prophet Nathan comes to David and, and just to save the whole story, he confronts him with the sin that he has in his life. And David does what you and I must do. He became broken before God. But in Psalm 51, you don't have to turn there. We're not even going to have it on the screen. I just want, to, just want to tell you the story. In Psalm 51, David is writing a psalm, and he's writing this psalm about his experience of what he felt like when he realized that he was a fool. When he realized what he had done in his life. And in Psalm 51, verse 3, he says these words. He says, my sin is ever before me. The Hebrew language of that lends itself to him, for him to say, my sin haunts me. I don't ask anybody to give any testimony of that, but let's just be honest. I don't know if there's a single one of us in here who does not have a past that haunts us in some way or another. Think about the, the most disturbing sin you've ever had in your life. Think about the most disturbing thing. Think about the furthest you've walked away from what you know what God had taught you to be. It's, it's locked behind some closet door somewhere. It's there that we pray. We put locks up over it. We cover it up. We pray nobody ever opens that door. Every time we walk past that door, the stench of our past, it, 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 it nauseates us and it haunts us. And at least for that moment, we became fools. We allowed our rebellion to make us make some very foolish, foolish, foolish mistakes. Can I, can I even, can I rephrase what I just said? I think that sometimes we've, we've tried to desensitize it and, and we, you know, we call it, well, we've made a mistake or I've messed up. Let's just call it what it is. It is sin. It is rebellion against God. And this verse says it makes us a fool. I don't like it. If you came up and called me a fool, I probably would bow up with you. I'm a man. Yet when I'm faced with the reality of what God says about the sin that is in my life, 
I realize that some of us have a past that haunts us. But the next part of verse 17 into 18, we understand greatly that sin has consequences. Look at the next part. It says, some became fools, this is verse 17. Some became fools through their rebellious ways, and listen, and suffered affliction because of their iniquities. They loathed all food, and look what this last part says, and drew near the gates of death. For those of us, when we step from rebellion into this foolish life, into this foolish walk that we have, let me just simply remind you today, sin has consequences. Sometimes we don't even realize the consequences. Sometimes we don't even weigh that out. Can I tell you the consequences that have, that if, for me as a father and as a husband, when I become a fool to sin, the consequences go to the most precious people that I have in my life. They go to my wife, and even worse, they trickle down into those two precious girls of mine. Sin has consequences. I promise you, folks, I've heard people say, you know, I've got sin in my life that I've been able to keep hidden for my whole life. No, you haven't. You may have hidden it from every single person, but I can promise you there are two people who know everything you've ever done. The first one is you. And the second one is God. And because of that, our sin haunts us and the consequences that come along with it. It's difficult. It's tough. There are incredible consequences to sin. Let me just remind you today, you can't live a life centered in sin. Put it to the context of this. You can't live a life as a fool and expect the blessings of God to fall down on you. You can't. You can't live a life as a fool and expect God to bless your family. You can't live a life as a fool and expect God to bless your marriage. You can't live a life as a fool and expect God to bless your life. There's consequences. Can I tell you one of the worst consequences you could ever imagine to your sin? I've met with people throughout time who have lost their wives, lost their husbands, who've lost their children. Children won't even speak to them. I've met with people who through sin have lost their jobs. I've met with people who because of their sin have lost all of their finances, all of their retirement, all of their future. I've met people that through their sin lost their freedom end up in jail. You say, those are pretty hard consequences. Can I tell you a consequence that is far greater than that? When we lose our integrity. And by losing our integrity, our testimony becomes shot. Sin has consequences. And I tell you the greatest consequence that I can ever imagine to the sin of a Christian's life is, is the black mark that it gives, the black eye that it gives to the gospel. When you share the gospel over and over and over and over, and the number one excuse that people give you for not wanting to accept the gospel and not wanting to be part of God's church is they'll say this, that church is filled with a bunch of hypocrites. I used to get fired up about that. It, it just ruffled my feather that anybody would accuse me of being a hypocrite. It just ruffled my feathers to think that somebody would look at First Baptist Moody or wherever we're at and say that there's just a bunch of hypocrites there until I sat back and I looked at God's word and I evaluated my own life and what I realized is we are a bunch of hypocrites. Can I tell you something, though? Praise God. Remember the, 
of all the things that they accused Jesus of throughout his three and a half uh, years of ministry and 33 and a half years that he was here on earth. They accused him of all kinds of things. But do you know one of the, the things that they accused him of over and over and over and over and over of that I'm very thankful for? They would look at Jesus and they would say, who is he that he would eat with a bunch of sinners? Who is he that he would hang out with those heathen? Who is he that they said when, when the woman, uh, you know, who had been uh, literally at his feet and she had a life past that was horrible. And they looked at him and they said, oh, if he just knew the life of that lady that was at his feet. Can I tell you something? He knew. He goes, he goes and spends time with Zacchaeus and the other tax collectors. And they criticize him. Who is he that he would eat with the publicans and the sinners? David, can I tell you something? Praise God for a Savior that will eat with a sinner. Praise God. Sin has consequences, but God's grace is greater. Some of you are in here today, and, and, and it's hard to sit and think about these things. I've seen people so broken over things in their life, and they, sit and they say, I have absolutely no future there's nothing left. Can I tell you something? Those of you that are here, those of you that are listening at home, those of you that are going to be watching this video uh, uh, throughout the week or whatever else, can I to remind you of something? You have a future with Christ. He is not through with you. For God so loved a bunch of foolish sinners that he gave his son Jesus Christ. Verses 19 and 20 give us the steps to freedom. These are great verses. Steps to freedom, the first part of verse 19, is to cry out to the Lord. Look what it says. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble. When the girls were little, they would be out doing something. They would be, you know, they would, one of them would fall, one of them would get hurt, and they would call, Dad! Even today, I will receive a phone call, I'll receive two phone calls today at some point in time. One will be from Miss Megan Mosley, one will be from Miss Abby Mosley. They'll be vastly different phone calls, by the way. I could not have two more opposite kids that I love dearly. Abby calls me the other day. She says, Dad, my car's running hot. I said, baby, I'm two hours from you. What you going to do to fix it? Dad, I don't know what to do to fix it. I said, well, if you'll go to the store and FaceTime me, I'll tell you what to get and how to go about it. They call on me. I don't care how old they get, they're always going to be able to call their daddy. And can I tell you something? I don't care how far down the foolish journey of life that you've made it. You can always call on Abba Father. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble. You cry out to the Lord, the next step in freedom. Trust in God's grace. Look at the next part of verse 19. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble. And look what it says. And he saved them from their distress. I was counseling with somebody. It's probably been maybe a year ago. I'm not real sure. And I mean, their, their, their life you've heard the phrase, it was a train wreck, and, and it was. And they were just, I mean, they were squalling their eyes out in my office. 
And through their tears, he looked at me and he said, Brother Brad, I can't forgive myself. And I looked at him and I told him something that I don't think he expected me to say. He said, Brother Brad, I can't forgive myself. And I looked at him and I said, you're exactly right. That's why Jesus died. You can't forgive yourself, but I can assure you that God can. Remember when we talked a second ago about that closet, that stench that, that, that you keep locked away that you pray nobody sees? He died even for that one. Not only did he die for it, can I tell you, his death conquered that one. You cry out to the Lord, and then we trust His grace. We say, I don't deserve God to love me like this. I don't deserve salvation. I don't deserve God's grace. I don't deserve God's mercy. And all we can say to that is an overwhelming amen. Praise God, our salvation is not dependent on what we deserve. If our salvation was dependent on what we deserved, I'd have some very bleak sermons to preach. Our salvation is not dependent on what we deserve. Our salvation is dependent on the work that Christ did on the cross for you and I. Completed. It is finished. It was done. Completed for you and I. What a beautiful name it is. What a powerful name it is. Jonathan, that's one of my favorite songs. The very first time I ever heard that song, and, I, and maybe this is why I love it so much. The very first time I ever heard that song, I was on a boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. They had these speakers on the boat, and they played this song. We were in the, right in the middle of it, and I've got a video. I, I'm doing, if you'll remember, I took videos of all the places we went so that I could use them during sermons and everything. And during my video, in the middle of the boat, in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, you can hear in the background, what a beautiful name it is. And it's just going, and I wept like there was no tomorrow. <coughs> And there is some, there's, a, there's a, a phrase in that song, and it says this, and I want to remind you of this. My sin was great. His grace was greater. Praise God for that. Trust in God's grace. The second step to freedom, dig into God's word. Look at the first part of verse 20. It says that he sent out his word, and he healed them. Well, there's a, couple of, there's a couple of theological thoughts that we can have for this. First of all, God's Word is powerful. God's Word is the greatest love letter that you have ever received. Spoken through the very heart of God. It is God-breathed. It is absolute truth. It is completely without error. It is the absolute authority for our lives. It is the road map for you and I in every step that we do. God's word is powerful. It is so powerful. You don't believe me? Just read it. I love reading God's word. And you know what, as much as I love reading God's Word, I love when people who have never been used to reading God's Word all of a sudden get fired up to read God's Word. And, and the excitement that comes with it. I love discipling people through God's Word. I love getting messages that said, this is amazing. And I go back and read it, and I've become almost desensitized to some of it. And then I go back and read it, and it's just fresh again. 
God's word is powerful. It says in that verse, it says that he sent out his word and he healed them. I told you earlier, Isaiah 55 says this about God's word. It says that God's word goes out and it accomplishes that which God designed it to do. And it says in Isaiah 55, it does not return void. It is that powerful. But can I tell you another theological thought about God sending out his word? John 1.1 1, 1. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. That's Jesus. In other words, in the midst of our darkness, when we cry out, to the name of Jesus Christ. When we cry out to the Lord and we trust in God's grace, He gives us His Word and He gives us the Word. Jesus Christ. There's nothing greater I can ever tell you. We cry out to the Lord. We trust in God's grace. We dig into God's word. The last part of verse 20, we live for the eternal, not the temporal. It says in verse 20 again, he sent out his word and he healed them. And then it says this, he rescued them from the grave. Ephesians chapter 1, you don't have to turn there. But it's talking about the fact that you and I have been chosen before the foundation of the world. And it says, it says in verse 4, I believe, that we were chosen for a purpose. In love we were chosen. Skip on down, I think, in verse 11 or so of Ephesians chapter 1. It says we were chosen for a plan, that God has a glorious plan for us. And then you skip over, I think, to around verse 14 of Ephesians chapter 1. And it says that you and I were chosen, that when we trusted Christ, we were given a deposit, a guarantee to our eternal life. I'm excited about that. Can you imagine what it would be like if we lived our lives like we were living for eternity instead of for the temporal things around here? Can you imagine how different life would be? If we just didn't worry. I'm not saying we don't take care of things. I'm not saying that we don't be smart and do the things we have to do. But can you imagine if we set our hearts on the Lord? Can you imagine if we sought first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You remember what that verse says? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things, stuff, he says, will be added unto you. Live for the eternal, not the temporal. We'll close with this. And Jonathan, you guys come on up and begin to play because verses 21 and verse 22 are our invitation for today. I want to encourage you with something today. Throughout COVID, we've noticed something. I I was reading some things that Tom Rayner had put out there. I was reading some things. I've talked to some other pastors. And I think rightfully so, but because of COVID, there's one area that we've all noticed that has been has not been utilized as much. And that's the altar. And I want to just encourage you that this, you don't have to come and kneel at this altar, but you can kneel or you can pray right where you are. Because that altar is there right before you and God. The invitation is this, verse 21. Thank God for his salvation. It says, let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. When was the last time you just told God, thank you for your salvation? 
The second part of the invitation is the first, first part of verse 22. We not only thank him for his salvation, but we serve him sacrificially. First part of verse 22, let them sacrifice, thank offerings. You know what it is to sacrifice before God? We can get into the old sacrificial system. We can talk about all of that. But let, here, here it is. To sacrifice before God means that we lay everything before him realizing that it's all his in the first place. We go to God like this. Not so we can receive. But we go to God because we're empty before him. Complete brokenness before God. It says we thank God for his salvation. We serve him sacrificially. And I love the last part of verse 22. It says, and tell of his works with songs of joy. How many of you, maybe when you're driving in your car, Maybe you're in the shower, I don't know. But you like to just sing, worship. When I was a kid, I'd get on that old snapper lawnmower at the house, drive that thing around there. I never realized it, but mom said I sang to the top of my lungs. My oldest daughter, we, from the time she was big enough to get in the shower by herself, we could be two floors away from her. And she would sing so loud. And we loved it. There's times I'm driving down the road and whoever's next to me at the, at the stoplight I'm not going to lie to you. I've had people take pictures. I'm not lying. I've ended up on somebody's Facebook post. You know why? Because we're overwhelmed by the fact that a fool like us has been given a grace and a mercy and salvation from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So here I am, a fool so many times. But can I tell you something today? I'm a fool that's been saved. Give thanks to the Lord, for he's good. His love endures forever. 